Hi guys, I'm Mike. And I'm Mark. And this is F1 Fanatics. Welcome back to the feeder series and we have Mr F1 feeder series joining us here today and that is Floris. So Floris, welcome to the channel. Hi guys, thanks for having me. Oh, no problem at all, Floris. Thank you for taking the time to kind of come out and chat some feeder series with us. And we've brought Floris in to be the more positive light in terms of the best top five uh, drivers in the speeder series in the 2010s. So I'm actually going to hand you back over to Mark and Floris, and they're going to talk us through uh, a couple of honourable mentions and one dishonourable mention before we crack into the uh, top five list. So, Mark, over to you. Well, our first and only honourable mention is Romain Grosjean. Floris, do you want to cool. tell us why he makes the honourable mention list? Well, this is uh, more your choice, but... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll pass it off to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Roman Grosjean. He, uh, we're actually we're talking about uh, feeder series uh, from 2010 onwards, but he falls just into that category. Um, Roman, he actually actually um, during his F2, I think it was a GP2 career. He already went to F1 and he went back. Um, well, I think he still won the championship. Don't think if you still know that, Mark. Yeah, he won the championship in um, 2011, didn't he? Um, which got him his seat back with uh, Lotus for the 2012 season to partner Kimi Raikkonen. And yeah, it was. I think he was GP2 Asia at the time in 2009. But obviously, we know that Crashgate, uh, when that came to light, led him being uh, prematurely kind of put into that team. Uh, with Renault and having the unlucky job of partnering Fernando Alonso, which uh, you'll ask many of his teammates is not the best place to be. Other than Giancarlo Fisichella, who loved him. I mean, I think I would rather be put into the room of the elephant's foot in Chernobyl than partner Fernando Alonso. <laughs> one one is certainly less toxic and dangerous. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're we're gonna t later on. We're gonna talk about another driver um, who got his career ruined by uh, Fernando Alonso. Um, but yeah, we were talking about Romain Grosjean, and he won like um, I think maybe six, seven series. It's unbelievable, actually. Um, it started a long time ago in two thousand three. Three. Um, he won the Formula Lista Junior 1.6, something that doesn't exist anymore, but it doesn't matter because he, but he ra raced 10 races and he won 10 times. Can't, he can't do any better. Um, of course, him being French, he went to French Formula Renault. He also won like 10 from 16 races. Um, he went to a Formula 3 and he won there. And he went to GP2 Asia, like Mark said, and he won there. Um, so yeah, I'm actually I'm now thinking: should we have picked him over somebody else? I uh, I think I think uh, the someone else gets ahead, and mainly due to his career being more in the 2010s. Yeah, yeah. I think that was a deciding factor. Yeah, yeah. One yeah. was more in the 2010s. Yeah, exactly. But it was pretty stellar, and you can you can say that Grosjean actually. Apart from a good year at, I think, Lotus, pretty much disappointed uh, looking at his Peter Series career. I think we have a bigger disappointment coming up. <laughs> yeah, we have one. Yeah. I think, it, I think we're actually talking about this. I mean, very similar things. Partners with Fernando Alonso, big disappointment. <laughs> it's a recurring theme, clearly, in the feeder. But Roman Grosjean was an honourable mention. Like we said, he he could have maybe made this list, but as his majority of his feeder career was in the 2000s, he just missed out. But he was certainly worth mentioning, I think, on this rest. That GP2 championship win in 2011 was pretty dominant as well. But um, we move on to uh, our dishonourable mention. I believe uh, this one's uh, for you, Floris. <laughs> well... I, I don't want to be the mean guy, but uh, yeah, it's Lance it's, it's Stroll. Because if you, if you look at his 
uh, feeder series career and you just you look at the numbers it's awesome just just you know google it now and it's 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 all he, he wins uh, titles and stuff he, he won, i think he won uh euro f3 um but that is a interesting story because when you look at it i think he was maybe 17 years old or something so really young also it might have been his first year even he was with uh, prima but the story was, and I don't know exactly the details, but his dad, uh, Lawrence Stroll, of course, um, bought the team or bought into the team. And he contracted all these uh, F1 engineers and stuff. So they had all the, the top people and the top team to just blow the other teams away. So, of course, you win a title that, that, that um, means you're not bad, but it doesn't mean you're like a big talent. I think that's the fair assumption of what Lance Stroll is. He clearly has talent there. He, he wouldn't have made it as far as he was because there's been plenty of people that we mentioned last week um, who have had the same resources or a lot of resources pumped into them and still being absolutely dreadful. But, I think the question with Stroll is... Although he is talented, would he have achieved what he achieved if he had if he hadn't had the funding? If he was had a regular amount of funding, would he have been as dominant as he was? Well, I think that's, I think that's a fair fairest question to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. I, I do. I don't think so. But I think if he would have made it to F one eventually. Um, you can see in his first year that he was really out of his depth. And um, from what you heard and read and the rumors were that he didn't, he was just really bad in F1 at giving feedback. So it was all the time he was like, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what to do. And his uh, qualifying still is really poor. So I think if he would have made it to F1 in that scenario, I think after one year he would be, he would be gone. Yeah, I think that's probably a fair assessment of Lance. And what what you could argue is, is you know, both him and Max went to F1 early and Max Max himself had to do a lot of learning in the process, but he's he's thrived under it because, well, Max is a much better talent than what Lance Stroll is and adapted to those where Lance probably would have been a better driver if he stayed in the feeder series because he would have learnt these things a lot better, like some of these other names that are on the list coming up. But I think this is probably the perfect time to move into our top five. And so coming in at number five is Esteban Ocon. And he came third in the Euro Formula Renault in 2013. He was first in the FIA uh, Formula 3 Championship in 2014. And GP3, he also came first in 2015. Before then, he made his step up into Formula One with Manor Racing. And then obviously we know he would then later go into um, Force India, Racing Point, and now to be at Renault in the 2020 season, when hopefully it eventually gets going. But yes, uh, Mark Flores, who wants to start off talking about Mr. Esteban Ocon? Uh, Does anyone really want to talk about Ocon? <laughs> okay, Mark, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. And uh, <laughs> if you want, you can, you can add something. Um, but I, I think the, the most interesting thing about Ocon, about his uh, junior formula career, is um, no, actually two things. You have the season uh, in European F3, where he went up against uh, Max Verstappen, of course. That was really uh, some kind of battle of the titans. Ocon uh, was in the junior feeder series since 2012. So he had a little bit of experience. Um, he was in his third year, and Max just, you know, came straight from karting to F3. That's not that's not a normal thing. Um, they went uh, against each other. Uh, Ocon was with, I think, uh, Prima, Prima, and Max was with uh, Van Amersfoort Racing, Dutch team. Um, and in the end, Ocon won nine races. Max won more races. He won ten. But Max had more highs and lows. Max had, for instance, much more retirements. But Ocon, and uh, you probably know this, uh, his, his nickname being, or, or I made it up, I don't know, is Oconsistency, because um, he was super consistent. So next to his, all his first places, he got a lot of second places. Max had a lot of retirements. And you see with Ocon, 
in his further uh, feeder series career, you had uh, GP3, where he uh, won the title, but he only won one race, and his teammate won five races. He still he, he still went on to become champion. So what I think is Ocon is really, really talented, just not of the caliber of, say, Max and Charles. Mm. Yeah, I'd have to agree. And um, looking further back in his career, uh, uh, Formula Renault Euro, well, the Euro Cup before it was World Two Point Oh. Um, he did well as a rookie, but he actually wasn't the best rookie. He was beaten by fellow Frenchman Pierre Gasly. And it's just amazing at the path they they took since then that um, how Ocon beat him to F one when. At, well, early on, it looked like Gasly had the up, upper hand out of the two French juniors. Yeah, which is which is a pretty interesting point because you also see from this and from another guy we're talking about later on that uh, a good or a bad junior career doesn't really say that you're a bad or a good driver. Yeah, there's oh, certainly but... a lot of circumstances that yeah. have to kind of come into place to do it. it 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 essentially is just a fight to f1 you you've got to prove enough in that feeder series that you can get that top seat and you know some people like ocon and max went straight from f3 well the dishonorable mention in lance as well straight straight from f3 into f1 where others on this path have gone all the way up through the feeder ladder to get there it doesn't matter how you get there i suppose it's can you get there yeah, and it's it's also the 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 president uh, Max uh, Verstappen set is really unfair to other drivers because now it's expected that you just you know your feeder series career lasts one or two years and if it lasts longer you're not good enough and that's really no, unfair. Because Max is president. I would say it's not just um it's not just Verstappen who's set that standard. I would say that. Someone else who's set a standard, well, two drivers at Leyland and Lissi also set an unfair standard for rookie performances. Yeah, who? Would you agree with that? Oh, we, we, we're leaving those secret, Floris, because, you know, they're, they're to come yet on the list. Ah, right. We, we, we yeah. can't reveal early, Floris. Yeah, yeah. No, but, no, but I, I have to say, just one year in a feeder series, in feeder series at all, it's just. It's crazy. You you mm. just can't do that and not be out of your depth. Yeah, I think uh, Kimi Raikkonen did it. Maybe, maybe in two years, I don't know. But that's yeah, that's really tough on those drivers. Yeah. Mm. So we will time move for on to number four, number. and that is Stoffel Van Dorn. And so Stoffel has um, a pretty successful junior career. His first F four championship, he won. Uh, came third in the Formula Renault um, NEC. Uh, he won the Euro Cup Formula Renault the year after. Uh, came second in the Formula Renault 3.5 series. But his GP2 series in 2014, I think he started really to kind of gain recognition. Uh, where he gets second there. And then McLaren, I think, set him a real high standard in 2015 to win the championship in style, which he did. And uh, then obviously made his way into Formula One with McLaren finally getting the seat in 2017. So, um, Mark, Flores, who's, uh, well, we had Flores start last time. So, Mark, I'll let you lead in with Stoffel. Stoffel Van Dorn, arguably the biggest disappointment in the past decade, if not two. If you look at his feeder series, you think this man is going to be something big. He's going to be huge he's got consistency he's got speed he's looking really good and then he fell flat on his face yeah yeah what i what i saw when i was uh, doing a little bit of research and i didn't think about this that it almost sounds like something from another time because he uh made his debut in formula one when he was 24 years old which is actually quite kind of yeah, which is actually kind of old. Old old by modern standards, I would yeah, say. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Mm. Yeah, so 24 years old, uh, and he had uh, seven years in feeder series, which is quite long. So, I, you know, he, 
he had a stellar FIDE Series career, but a long one. Uh, I have to say, in GP2, uh, he won a record amount of races, which is, you know, which is probably also why we put him in this list. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what was it? Did he hit, didn't he hit um, 11 or 12 race, race wins? Uh, I Fine. think he, he, he won uh, 11 races in total, but he, he has the record for uh, most wins in one season, which was seven. Yep, I thought so. But no, he's just... You look at his stats, you look at what he did in the feeder series, and you and even if you look at the age, you think, okay, he's a late bloomer, but he's got speed, he's got consistency, he's going to be good. Yeah, but, it, but I, don't, I, don't, I still don't really know why it didn't pan out. I don't know. He's just, and even now, when you look at him in Formula E, he just doesn't have the speed that he that that he had back when, in GP two. So like, we've lost that Stoffel Van Dorn like that. Stoffel Van Dorn is still in a GP two car somewhere. But but is it? Do you think he he doesn't care anymore? But he, because he doesn't look like that kind of guy. No, I mean, I don't know if maybe the GP2 car suited him more, or that mm-hmm. style, so maybe maybe he'd be amazing in Super Formula. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, but, he came fourth I, in Super Formula, didn't he, in 2016? So that wasn't a bad uh, effort, considering how difficult Super Formula is to be successful in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. he did. And it's just a matter of, like, you just look at everything, and you just, you can't help but feel let down, like, we were meant to see something great, but yeah. we never did. Yeah, yeah, too bad. Same with uh, a little bit with uh, Pierre Gasly, I guess, because he also he went to Super Formula, which is which is really hard, and he almost won the title, just you know, one point difference or something. So, yeah, well, yeah. Argu- arguably he would have won it, but the typhoon hit because he um, right. yeah, he looked really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. in the practice for that race, he was well ahead, but it got uh, cancelled. Yeah, but but that, I guess that is a different case because with Gasly, when he went to Red Bull, it's more probably uh, more of a mental thing. I mean, from what I've heard, it sounded like the car didn't suit his driving style at all, as well as being mental and not feeling exactly ready for it. But apparently, the car just did not suit him at all. Yeah, yeah. I think Gasly yeah. and Van Dorn probably suffered both uh, the same thing in terms of they gone into a team that is very much their teammates team so with Van Dorn uh, with Fernando Alonso we all know that he pretty much demands number one status within a team which for any young driver coming in no matter how good you are that's going to put you on the back foot uh, from the off and with Red Bull we all know that all the eggs are behind Max Verstappen uh, probably arguably rightly so um, but you know, with Pierre Gasly, it was always going to be difficult. And as their driving styles do, I, I think, differ quite a lot, his and Max, it was always going to be difficult to get the resources behind him to really find that perfect setup to succeed. And I, I think they're probably key examples talking about Gasly and Van Dorn together because in the feeder series, you can have all the success, but you've also got to find and fall into the right team environment to F1 to succeed, which neither of them have. Well, Gasly's still got a chance to, but um, Van Dorn, I think his age that we've mentioned here played against him because his uh, time frame was limited to prove something. Yeah, that's true, because he's now 28 years old, yeah, and there are so many talented drivers. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I, there's no way, I think, he's coming back. All right. So, no. that probably rounds Stop off a disappointment quite nicely. But Valtteri Bottas uh, is going to come in in P3 on this list, which I think, you know, the man who looks quite old, I always think Valtteri is, maybe yeah. harshly so, but he is only, I think he's still 29, he might have switched over to 30 in this time. Yeah, um, but, but yeah, he's, you know, his junior career did come in, although started in the 2000s, it went off into the... Um, 2010s as well and so notable performances third in the formula renault in 2007 uh, won the euro formula renault and the formula renault nec in 2008 uh, he won back-to-back masters of formula three which was obviously um uh, just a single race but impressive to win that back-to-back 
And uh, his last notable achievement before progressing to Williams in Formula One was winning the GP3 series. And another one on drivers that we've spoken about who made that step up from GP3 straight into Formula One. So, Flores, I'll leave you to kind of lead in with Valtteri. Yeah, exactly. That, that, the, the last part you, you told, I wanted to start with that because uh, you see um, maybe the really talented drivers always take the... No, nah, that's not true. But oftentimes they make the step from GP3 or F3 to F1. You see it in the case of Bottas and you see it in the case of Max. And I think it was uh, Ocon also. So Yeah, Ocon as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so that so that's interesting. Actually, uh, most of the grid, if you uh, look at it, came from F three first. Yeah, yeah. This, it, I it think Ricardo, was... Ricardo yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, who else? I know. I'm not missing a few. Um, yeah, I don't know. You, because we're going to talk about the other. Yeah, I don't know, but. I don't know if that's a factor, but um, it's it's Maybe. like it's, it's like with with soccer when you go from the youth team to the first team and you skip the reserves. It feels like that. But we see it happening less and less, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there are not enough places in Formula One seats, I think. No, and I want to get the best of the best. And would you also say that it has helped that? I would I guess I'd call it the F2 renaissance. So F2 was really, it had a real low point, I'd say, in the start of the 2000s. Mm-hmm. The 2010s was, you'd argue that GP3 was the better series almost. Yeah, and, and th- that is true because if you look at the champions, I think around that time you had guys like uh, Fabio Leimer and uh, David Fasecki, of course. So those I are- don't. Don't don't knock Davide. I he's love the guy, I love the guy, but he's a better commentator than driver. Oh yeah, yeah. And so. of course, let's not forget the biggest piss take of an F two champion, Jolian Palmer. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Also uh, a very 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 skilled analyst, but not a skilled driver. He certainly has grown in that area, has Paul Jolian. But yeah, with Valtteri. I think he kind of goes under the radar because I think a lot of people's opinion of him has it's dropped. based on being Hamilton's lapdog. Yeah, exactly. But he was actually very talented uh, in his days at Williams when back when Williams was still a competitive outfit back in the 2014 and uh, 15 seasons as well. But th- that impressive, he won a lot of junior series um, during his time in the feeder series, which... Uh, again, another guy who spent, well, what is that, four years coming five up years. through the feeder series? It was five years in total. Yeah. So he, he certainly got through a lot of series in that time. Yeah, this is just, uh, this is just how, how it went back in the day normally. Uh, like I said, like with uh, Kimi Raikkonen, that was just, that was really an exception in those days. He's so ta- he was so talented. Um, but I guess this is normal. He even went to the uh, Finnish army. Because you have to do that as a Finn uh, before he went to F1, and and he also had I think like some sort of gap year where he didn't uh, race, but he was just a test driver for Williams. Uh, um, but with Bottas, it feels like a little bit like uh, Rubens Barrichello because uh, he was also really talented. He went to F1. He was also really good there with Jordan, and I know where he was. But when he uh, went to Ferrari, he was uh, Mike, Michael Schumacher's lab dog. And that's when it ended. And it really, I think it damaged his reputation. I think Valtteri has the same. Because as you said, he was really, really talented in the junior series. Yeah. Anything else on Valtteri for you, Mark? No, I think what he said basically nailed it on the head. <laughs> I, yeah, the only thing I just I I, I uh, uh, jotted down was uh, a really small tidbit. But he used to be uh, he used to study car mechanics, so uh, he used to check uh, on his own gearbox in Formula Ren- Renault. It says something when you have like that. It's uh, a good trait. It's a, definitely a good trait to have as a driver. Yeah, exactly. So I think that helps him in his F one career even. Yeah. Massively so. I, I know Sebastian Vettel has a massive interest in engineering on those side. They're, they're the more the types of the 
the Nicky Lauder malts that have kind of inspired to come through there. There are the ones who just love to jump in a race car and race. And there are others who actually enjoy understanding what their race car does to help them go quick. And Valtteri is certainly one of those characters. But we'll move on to position number two on the list. And uh, another one on the current grid, and that is George Russell. And made his start in uh, British F4, came first in that series, uh, came second in the Masters of Formula 3 back in 2015. In the uh, Formula 3 European Championship, he was third uh, before winning GP3 and then winning F2 in consecutive years, which then flew him into Williams and tipped to go to the very top of F1. Now, so, uh, Mark, is, I I'll leave should... you to talk about George. I, I was about to pass him off to you, actually, since you're a big fan of him, and you don't. This is probably the drop, one of the main drivers on the list you can really fairly talk about quite a bit. You're a big fan of George, aren't you? I am yeah, indeed. Bro. So uh, I think with George Russell, I, there's something about him that has an air of a very successful driver. I think he's got a very mature set of uh, head on his shoulders. And I, I think that showed through his junior career that once he, he he's very early on knew how to lead a championship and that there's a way to the way that he drives through. And uh, he's had it since his feeder series days that he feels very comfortable at leading a race. And he, he knows what to do to get that win. And his, his level of performance is very consistent. And, uh, well, obviously the guys that he beat um, in his GP2, well, F2 season, was uh, Alexander Albon and Lando Norris. Uh, Norris obviously had a very successful uh, junior career up until that stage. But George Russell was able to find a way. Uh, obviously the ART team massively help because they're a very successful team uh, in that aspect but I think it's transpired into F1 and although the Williams car wasn't there his way that he dominated qualifying and his consistent performance in it I, I think is a real hallmark of how he just really progressed through his entire career Yeah, I, I think uh, Russell is really really talented, like you said you can see it from his Vita Series career it was kind of short. Uh, he won a lot, uh, but the only thing, not, I'm not concerned, but I just don't know how good he really is. I don't think you can put him into a Mercedes from a Williams because that, that Williams is just too slow. And he beat uh, a guy with, uh, with one hand, basically, uh, who, who made his comeback after 10 years. So you can't really measure how, how good he is yet. I do have confidence I think he's really good, and I think yeah. I'm not what sure. I, hmm? I, what I will say in his defense is when he did do the testing for Mercedes last year, he was extremely fast. But yeah. it is testing, but he definitely looked on pace. Still, he has everything. Like you said, he has everything going for him, and he's just, he looks really good. But I, I, first, I, I'd like to see him like in a midfield team who has, uh, you know, a chance of. Uh, Q3 and stuff, and then and, and then put him up against maybe like a, a pair, a Perez or a Ricciardo or something, and then let's let's uh, take it from there. Yeah, a move to Aston Martin uh, might yeah. be a very smart move, and moving someone like Lance Stroll to a reserve driver uh, role of some sort. But it, especially with the close link that Toto has with Lawrence Stroll as well, would probably be. The most natural, because obviously the the guy who did make the step to Williams to Mercedes in Valtteri Bottas, we spoke about it uh, when we spoke about him on this list, that Williams was a lot more competitive back in 2014-15. So you could get a real good idea of it where, yeah, it, it is a struggle uh, on that. But I think it's more the character they probably look at with George Russell. And he's the type of guy out of the guys coming in. Charles Leclerc, Max Verstappen, they act with an air of authority about them. And I think George has that, especially over, say, the Lando Norris and Alexander Albon he came up with. He he acts more like a potential uh, championship winning driver than they do. Well, I yeah, think it, anyone 
anyone seriously believes Albon has uh, has a championship potential? No, I don't think so either. I don't think he's he's just he's he's a good number two. Maybe he's not even a good number two. We don't we no. still don't know that yet. He's he's an adequate number two. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm I'm still not convinced about Albon because everybody's raving about him that he did did so well. But what did he do well? He um he did he better than the- Gasly. He was yeah. more consistent than Gasly, and so that's what he needs to. But yeah, the worry for someone like an Alexander Albon is he didn't compete with the Ferraris and Mercedes, and the only race that he was beating them was that Valtteri Bottas, Vettel and Leclerc all retired in Brazil, and then obviously the Lewis Hamilton because it happened, which he was unfortunate because that, that was Lewis's fault. But uh, unless, do we have anything else to round off on George Russell? Um, no, I think, no, on, I think yeah. we get to the main event. <laughs> Let's go. So number one, I don't think is going to come to any surprise to anyone because he basically flew through his feeder career in a bit of a blink of an eye because he was very successful, uh, had success. Well, came second in the Formula Renault Alps in his uh, first season within the feeder series. Uh, came second in the Macau Grand Prix in 2015, and then GP3, GP2, one in his first years, and then straight into Alfa Romeo, and a year later into Ferrari. Basically, Charles Leclerc, if anyone has taken a fast route through the series to the top spots in Formula One, it is Charles, but he's a driver, certainly I think you guys are going to discuss who has the talent to back up that faith that teams have put in him to almost fast track him? Oh, easily, easily. He's he's, I would say, a once in a generation talent. He is supremely fast, clean, and consistent. And if you want any proof to why Charles deserves to be in F one, even if you don't already believe it, go look at the sprint race in the in the GP two race. In um, Bahrain. Yeah. Yeah. He, it was he, in, he, he won it from uh, 12th on the grid, I think. He won it from 12th on the grid and pitted with, I think, five laps to go. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It's and great. then we came back out in, I think, eighth. Yeah. And then overtook and won every, overtook everyone and won the race. Yeah. With a lap was, to go. Yeah. That was that was a, a masterclass. I, I'm I'm I still don't. Also with with him, I don't hundred uh, percent know how to rate him. I almost do, but okay, he he went to Ferrari and he beat Vettel, but uh, he's not the only one to beat Vettel. It's oh, maybe yeah. maybe a bit harsh by me, but I, I, because I do think he's he's uh, championship material, but. What he's he's maybe like you said, maybe not once in a generation. I think he is. Yeah, but who's is he the only one? You think? No, I, no, 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 no. Exactly. I think there's. I think there are. If we were to look at the grid rule as it is now, there are three drivers that I think are going to go down in the history books: George Russell, Charles Leclerc, and Max Verstappen. Yeah. I think you're right. Those, those three are once in a generation talents that will be remembered in F1 for a long time. Yeah, yeah, that could be. And it, his junior career, like uh, like you said, Mike was uh, was also stellar because he he, he won GP3 and uh, F2 in his first year. And I think in F2 he also uh, won seven races, so that's equal to Stoffel, although that was GP2. But he was uh, he's still super talented, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think it's quite funny with, obviously, these last two on the list. You know, it then we obviously mentioned Max as well. But obviously, Charles and George did their learning in the feeder series where essentially Max Verstappen doesn't make this list because his feeder series basically was F1. Yeah. Um, yeah. By going into it so early... You know, he learned his trade in Toro Rosso, getting that promotion to Red Bull so early. And it's it's probably the main thing that has an advantage over his competitors because he's been within the pressure of the F1 sport and media pressure for that bit longer than them. But with Charles, 
it's just his pace. He, he's not only he's been able to find the consistency that goes with his pace, which I think is a, what a lot of feeder series drivers struggle with. Uh, a lot of drivers are quick. You know, a lot of ones can, you know, really dominate a race and on their day be anyone. But Charles has found a way to be consistent, be consistent in beating his teammate uh, Sebastian Vettel in his first season and, you know, really kind of making mark beating. I, I think the big positive of Charles Leclerc to show his pace was the fact that he beat Lewis Hamilton uh, in pole positions last year. Yes, the Ferrari, you could argue, uh, maybe it was a quicker car on the Saturday. But and the things around that, that you, we still don't know either way whether it was legit or not. But um, uh, it, it certainly, Ferrari had found a way of having a very quick car on a Saturday. But Charles took full advantage of that, really, even with some of the mistakes he did. But yet yeah, an incredible feeder series career in the last 2010s. And it'll probably reflect on his F1 career in the future that we'll wait and see what happens with Charles. Yeah, that's true. And uh, I think his, his big, his big, big test comes now because he's now the leader of the team. So can he be Ferrari's Michael Schumacher? But he, because he's only 22 years old, but he has to be old enough right now. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, he needs to do what Max has done at Red Bull. Yeah. And, you know, and Max saw off his more experienced teammate and in Max's first year as a leader of the team in 2019, he had his best season in F1 and dragged performances out of that car that a lot of people didn't expect. So that's that's what Charles has to match. And I think a lot of people would back him to do that. Um, but yeah, he's he's certainly worthy, I think, of this number one spot on the feeder series list. Um, but anything else from you, Mark, before we round off? I think we've nailed it all. Just, And I think we've got, got them in the right order as well. well yeah, right. I think that's perfect on that front. So that is our top five best feeder drivers of the 2010s. And Flores, a big thank you for coming on. It's been brilliant kind of chatting through these drivers. And it, funnily enough, we've dropped in a few more as the list goes on, as you yeah, know, sneaked in a couple, kind of, yeah. <laughs> it snuck in the, the Gasleys and the Norrises as well, which yeah. were entitled and worthy, I think, of a mention. Oh, yeah, Definitely easily. But, um, Floris, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you, guys. And uh, maybe I'll see you guys another time. I will make up another list and then we'll come uh, talk for an hour. Oh, of course. You know, uh, we, we're definitely up for that. We're, th with the feeder series, there's not much of the content out there on it. So we, we kind of bounce oh, no, I, I try. Kind of I try my best to <laughs> bring more knowledge to it. Well, yeah, just uh, you just have to follow uh, F1 Feeder Series on Twitter, and that's uh, it's enough. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and guys, he's plugged it there. But definitely, if you for some reason you aren't following the F1 Feeder Series, it is a fantastic place to keep up to date with all the feeder news, and obviously you get your little uh, driver chats in there as well, and interviews are. Uh, uh, what's happening with drivers and yep. a bit more full interviews as well, hopefully to come. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, yeah, just stay tuned. In I guess a week's time, we in a week time we have uh, the son of an ex F one driver, and not uh, one you immediately think of. Maybe some something of a cult hero. Just teaser. Exciting. Looking forward to that one, Floris. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but guys, I'll leave a link in the description down below to Floris's social medias on uh, Twitter and Instagram. But that's it from us today. So I hope you've enjoyed. And if you're new around here and you haven't done so already, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and click that bell notification for all your latest kind of feeder series content and F1 content here on F1 Fanatics. But for now, guys, you F1 fans, keep racing. <laughs>